Soldiers of the Press. This week, Night Patrol. Stand her off, Hoyt. I'm standing. Advance and make yourself known. I'm Clinton B. Conger of the United Press. Here are my credentials. Uh, what's your business here, Mr. Conger? Well, I don't know. The Admiralty informed me this afternoon that if I came down here tonight, the boys would see to it that I had an interesting time. I was told to say, Strawberry Control. <laughs> yes, sir. I think you'll have an interesting time, all right. Would you mind signing this, please, sir? United Press staff correspondent Clinton B. Conger signed a waiver releasing the British government from responsibility in case of injury or death. Then he was taken down deep into a great concrete structure along the waterfront. Thus began one of the many exciting adventures of United Press staff correspondents who bring you eyewitness accounts of world news as it happens. Listen to Clinton B. Conger's story of Night Patrol. Here you are, sir. Hiya, Fraser. Hey, uh, what's the pitch here? Where are we headed for? Holland. Oh, I don't want to go to Holland. They've got Germans there. <laughs> well, that's just where we're going, just the same. They promised me an interesting time, but that's apt to be just a little too interesting. Uh, how are we getting to Holland, if I may ask? Motor torpedo boats. You know, we call them PT boats back home. Oh, murder. And I get seasick as a dog just looking at a bowl of goldfish. <laughs> I should have stood in bed. You should. <laughs> I griped loudly and fervently, but just the same, I was pretty excited about the whole thing. I was going to get my first ride on one of Britain's highly secret patrol boats that sweep across the English Channel nightly to disrupt German shipping. As I stood talking with other correspondents in the underground dock, I became increasingly certain of one thing. Before the night was out, a whole mess of Germans probably would be taking pot shots at me. I anticipated the prospect with what might be called mixed emotions. After a half hour or so, the door opened again and a Navy officer came in. He was carrying a hat. Good evening, gentlemen. I have a hat full of numbers here. Each of you will please draw one. What's the idea? The numbers will determine which of the patrol boats each of you is to accompany. Uh, will you draw, please? One by one, we drew folded slips of paper out of the hat. I picked number one, the first boat. That meant I'd be in a position to see all of the action. But it also meant I'd be in the boat that the Germans would likely concentrate their fire upon. My shirt suddenly became very tight around my neck. Who has drawn the first boat? Uh, I did. Lucky Conger, Mr. Conger. <laughs> <laughs> Will you come this way, Mr. Conger? Go right to your boss and tell him how it happened, Clint. Yeah. Thanks, you luck. <laughs> I followed the British naval officer from the underground chart room into what at first appeared to be a storeroom of some kind. It was pitch black, it smelled of gasoline. As my eyes became accustomed to the dim light, I gradually made out the outlines of one of the British Hornets, which is what they call their PT boats. We went aboard the 80-foot craft. It vibrated gently underfoot from the throbbing of its three great motors. The young ensign met us on the wing of the bridge. Uh, Mr. Selfridge, this is Clinton Conger of United Press. Very happy to know you, Mr. Conger. Glad to have you aboard. I'll let you know later whether I'm glad I came or not. Well, I think I'll leave you now, Mr. Conger. You're in good hands. I'll see you when you get back. That sounds encouraging. I'll see you later. Uh, we're about to shove off, Mr. Conger. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to go down below until we'll see. All this is very hush-hush stuff, you know. <laughs> Sorry and all that, but there isn't any alternative. I understand. Which way do I go? Uh, Evans, uh, take Mr. Conger below and see if he's comfortable. Will you? I, will. I followed a seaman down through a narrow folding hatch that evidently was closed off during rough weather, and then down another short ladder into the crew's quarters. The seaman left me there, and I sat down, thought about life and things, about how many bullets there are flying around loose in the world that a man can get in the way of. Cast off, four and off, taking one and two. Taking it one, taking it two. All clear. Stand by. Take stations for getting underway. The thin hull of the torpedo boat vibrated a trifle more, and I could faintly sense that we were moving. From time to time, I could hear orders being shouted overhead. Evidently, something was being done about a huge door. I had the least idea of where we were or how we were going to get out to sea, and I still don't know. All I know is that after a half hour or so, the boat began pitching and tossing heavily, and I heard the officer barking, All hands, put on your May West. Man, battle station. So I put on the life preserver that the seaman had given me, and I tried to make myself as comfortable as possible on that narrow bunk. After a while, the motion of the boat and the humming of the engines lulled me to sleep. 
Mr. Conga. Uh, Mr. Conga. Thomas told me that the seaman wakened me, and I went up on deck with him. It was dark now, and I could barely see the other boats in the formation lined up behind us. I went up on the flying bridge. Uh, did you have a good nap, Mr. Conga? Yeah. Any excitement? No, not yet. I thought I might as well let you sleep on the way out. Very dull, really. But we're getting close now. Another hour or so, we'll be in the thick of it, I shouldn't wonder. Not too thick, I hope. <laughs> well, they told us to give you fellas a good show. So we're going a bit further in than usual. We're quite likely to have a first-rate rumpus. That'll be nice. Excuse me. Uh, quartermaster, tell the engineer to stand by for emergency changes of speed. Aye, aye, folks. I watched while the quartermaster crawled aft along the narrow deck to the engine room, where he opened a little hatchway in the deck. Then a head appeared in the opening. A quartermaster shouted into the ear of the engineer. He grinned, nodded, and then disappeared. I asked Selfridge about the engine room. It seemed awfully small from where we were standing. It is small. <laughs> Chaps have to crawl around on their hands and knees down there. Oh, well, there's more than one? Oh, quite. Two men, three engines. Dreadfully bad job, that. I shouldn't like to have it. Wear plugs in one's ears all the time, you know. Go deaf otherwise. Engines kick up a horrible fuss and hit top speed. You mean we aren't going top speed now? Heavens, no. Only about half. We can make 70 knots, you know. Well, I didn't know. But 70 knots is a healthy 80 miles an hour. I had a sudden great respect for these boats and for the men who run them. As we raced for the Dutch coast, I looked the boat over from end to end, hanging for dear life to a railing thoughtfully provided for that purpose. The forward end of the boat was high out of the water now. The stern was dug down deep as the propeller screwed into the sea. Everywhere I looked, there were machine guns and torpedo tubes. The ensign's elbow was a small deck gun. Altogether, this was the most deadly-looking weapon of war I'd ever seen. And I was on it, hurtling at top speed toward German-occupied Holland. Rattle down! Rattle down! Just go carefully now, Mr. Conger. Fine fields all around us. Fine fields? Uh, ours or theirs? Theirs. Oh, we must be getting close. I should say so. We're practically there, actually. The coast is a mile and a half off in that direction. I looked where he pointed, expecting the blackness to open up with the flash of gunfire. Nothing happened. I couldn't see a thing. Then Selfridge ordered the engines muffled, and an amazing quiet descended on our fleet. I was vaguely disappointed. I'd expected great things and a terrific amount of gunplay. Instead, we cruised up and down the Dutch coast as though we were in a lake back home. Seemingly, we owned the entire English Channel, and no one was in a mood to argue with us about it. Hours went by. I was on the verge of going below and returning to the arms of Morpheus when Selfridge spoke. Aha. Uh -huh. I beg your pardon? I said, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, but why? Business. A convoy. Jerry's. Where? There. I couldn't see a thing. I was about to tell Selfridge I thought he was imagining things when the night cracked wide open with a blaze of light. The Germans turned a searchlight on us. Take off the bubbles. Full speed. All right, brother. Hang on, Mr. Conger. I hung on. The torpedo boat almost leaped out from under us as the engines opened up. Then we twisted around in a complete circle faster than I can tell you about it. The searchlight tried to follow us, but couldn't. Then the whole fleet of torpedo boats dashed off in all directions. Selfridge grabbed his microphone. Hello? 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 Come in, Strawberry. All for Orange calling Strawberry. Come in, please. Hello, Jack. Strawberry here. Good boy, Tom. I think we have them rattled. You go left, I'll go right. We'll come in behind them. Is that understood? Over to you. Yes. I understand, Orange. See you later. Over and off. We raced through the darkness at full speed. I kept thinking about those minefields all around us, but evidently Selfridge didn't worry about them because we never slackened speed until we were on the other side of the German convoy. Then the mufflers were put on the motors again, and we crept slowly in towards the enemy ships. Everybody was tense and quiet. And then, dimly at first, I saw a large shape looming up ahead of us. An enemy ship. Stand by to fire torpedoes. Standing by, sir. Stand by all guns and train on target. Standing by, sir. Quietly, we edged toward the German ship. She was about a mile away when we first saw her. We covered about half the distance when a blinker light flashed at us from her bow. They're challenging us, sir. Answer them. What shall I say, sir? I don't know their code. Send anything. Just keep their minds occupied a few seconds longer until we can get in range. Aye, aye, sir. The quartermaster picked up a blinker tube and flashed an answer to the German ship, which had questioned our identity. Meanwhile, we crept closer and closer. <coughs> And the guns on the German ship erupted into flame, and the night was filled with whining billets. Open mufflers, full speed. Steer collision course. All guns fire. Now our boat leaped through the water again, directly at the German ship, right into the teeth of our machine guns and three-inch shells. I ducked down below the bridge and stayed there, crouched behind the bulkhead. Occasionally, I stuck my head up for a look. 
The enemy ship was really a small one, but she looked bigger than a battleship from where I sat. I felt acutely unhappy, especially so since we were steering directly for the enemy ship and going like a bat out of Brooklyn. Stand by for all the torpedoes! Standing by! Selfridge stood up with the tracers whistling around him and kept his eyes on the enemy ship. I was content to keep my eyes on Selfridge. All right, watch it now. I'm going to fire. Fire one! Fire two! Left brother, let's get out of here. Break his sticks going by. dropped our torpedoes and heeled over to get out of their way. I learned afterwards we went right by the torpedoes and kept on going past the German ship. I wasn't watching. I was huddled behind the comforting protection of the bulkhead. A few seconds after we heeled over and raced away, the whole sky seemed to fall in on us. Get out here! Did, did you see that, Mr. Conger? We got him! I thought for a second he got us. But I wasn't going to say so. I got up off my hands and knees. Selfridge helped me up. And did you fall, Mr. Conger? No, I uh, dropped my handkerchief when those bullets started whistling by. It's a nice bucket you got there. Yes, yeah, right. It'd be much nicer, however, if it were armor plate. <clears throat> Isn't it? Yeah, Great not. It's just plywood. You can spit through it. I, uh, I think I'll go lie down. It was quite an adventure. Several heavy German escort vessels came out after us, and we decided to call it a night, for which I was duly grateful. On our way back to England, the ensign apologized to me for not having been able to show us more excitement. I accepted his apology. You have been listening to United Press correspondent Clinton B. Conger's story of his experiences as a reporter aboard one of the lightning-fast British motor torpedo boats that patrol the English Channel. Conger is one of a worldwide staff of United Press correspondents who are eyewitnesses to events that are news. We will bring you another program dramatizing the experiences of these men of UP in the near future. Your local announcer will give you the time of that broadcast in just a moment. Be sure to listen. And meanwhile, listen for United Press news on the air. Look for United Press dispatches in your favorite newspaper. They are your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news.